Okay, let's start. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for joining uh, this seminar on AI and digital health and telemedicine. It's actually the third of a series of such webinars that we have organized this year to explore the various aspects of this huge and advancing uh, issue. Uh, today, uh, we'll uh, have a two uh, esteemed uh, two excellent speakers and then uh, followed by two comments and discussions and uh, a short uh, Q&A. So may I now introduce the uh, first speaker. Dr. Kendall Ho is an actually an old friend of Hong Kong. Uh, he is an emergency medical specialist and academic and also a leader in digital health in uh, BC uh, in Canada and actually I should say almost the whole of Canada now. Uh, he has lots of uh, sponsor and funded works uh, in this area, uh, and he has uh, worked on both uh, frontline uh, practice level and also uh, service organization and also uh, policy uh, level. Uh, he conducts his research in Canada internationally with collaborations with partners in Asia and Europe and Australasia, and is a member of the Canadian Virtual Care Task Force and also chairs the Canadian Association of Emergency Medicine Digital Emergency Medicine Committee. Uh, I, I will skip some of his other uh, awards and, and interests, uh, but uh, just to say that his work is really recognized both nationally and also with a lot of community engagement. And today he's going to share with us the topic of machine learning, artificial intelligence in emergency medicine. Uh, Kendall, please. Great. Well, uh, Professor Al, thank you so much uh, for a very kind introduction, and uh, I'm honored uh, to be here in this seminar. Uh, and uh, knowing that uh, uh, Ms. Oi has a wonderful presentation following. Also, I really want to thank Professor Sung and Professor Leung for being a discussant. So I'm really honored to be here. I look forward to doing some sharing, and I know that I'll learn a lot from this forum also. Uh, as uh, Professor Al said, uh, what I'd like to do is to present a little bit on uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in emergency medicine, my home clinical turf, if you will, as an emergency doctor. I just want to double check first, uh, uh, Professor Al, can you see my slide? Uh, on really screen? well, very okay. well. Okay, great. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, uh, in the next uh, 30 minutes, 29 minutes now, uh, I'll be speaking to this particular topic. As we all know, you know, uh, the whole digital health really over the last decade has been uh, very much a boom. Um, you know, a lot of people wearing watches, wearing, you know, mobile phones, wearing different kinds of devices so that they can quantify their blood pressure, the heart rates, etc. Uh, also, COVID pushed us into using digital technology very rapidly. Virtual care using technology like what we're using today to see patients historically was uh, just before the tipping point, before COVID, but now it's mainstream in most health system, if not all the health system. And so no wonder if you look at top right corner, uh, just on the digital, the sensors and wearable side, that this is a huge marketplace for many companies who wanna jump in. And also with different streams of data, uh, people start looking at the data itself and say, well, how do we combine these streams of data so that we can do analytics, so that we can use those data to actually help us to spring us into action? Really is the basis, if you will, of AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning. And to be able to leverage that would be a tremendous boom. What I'd like to do is for today, uh, just to share with you uh, four projects that we have done in emergency uh, in Canada, and also three emerging projects that we're doing. Really, just to talk a little bit about how we're learning on using sensors, wearables, and data analytics in emergency medicine, and then start to look at some of the potential implications in clinical care. And so I hope that it would stimulate some thoughts. And of course, I make a lot of mistakes. And so I really welcome some uh, uh, joint learning on moving this forward. This uh, study really started our journey in uh, machine learning and AI in emergency. Uh, we got this grant, uh, four, four year grant, uh, uh, five years ago. Uh, however, before that, we're looking at diabetic patients. How do we use sensors like weights, blood pressure at home to help them in home management? This really, this tech for home project is looking at heart failure patients. 
heart failure patients, how can we use and leverage these type of sensors and wearables to help them manage their disease better? If all of us in this room have heart failure and all of us get admitted, the Canadian data, which in fact mirrors many different countries' data, if we get discharged, one in four to one in five of us will get readmitted to hospital within one month. That's pretty significant data considering that for the patients, it's a very important disease that can affect them very, very significantly and they can get back in the hospital pretty fast. In the literature, there are two things that demonstrate that it can help decrease readmission. One is the patients manage themselves better, self-management improvements. And secondly, if how professionals can support them better when they're at home. And so in this study, we started with using blood pressure cuffs, oxygen saturation, weight, and a tablet to ask them questions. How are you feeling today? Are you feeling tired or short of breath? And then we have monitoring nurse to share with them a evidence-based self-management sheet, which is what you see in heart failure zone. So for example, if they start experiencing chest pain that's similar to the angina, don't wait for the nurse, you know, call the ambulance, go to hospital. If you start gaining weight over two pounds in one day and then follow with three pounds in the next day, you enter into a yellow zone. And so we will prioritize those calls to you and discuss how do we engage and intervene before you get into needing to go to hospital. And if you're doing well in green zone, everything's going well, we still call and encourage you and say, hey, great work, keep going on this. And so we're looking at how this might or might not help in monitoring when patients get discharged from hospital, monitor them 90 days, does that help them in heart failure management? And so we were able to publish our first study, the feasibility study in phase one, where we look at three hospitals and 70 patients to test out our protocol and test out our scales. And we found that surprising to us that in fact, 79% decrease in emergency visits, 87% decrease in readmission during that 90 days, and 58% decrease in emergency department cost per patient, and a 71% decrease in patients who are admitted because they were admitted shorter time and less complicated than the regular heart failure admissions. The quality of life improved by 101%. You may say, hey, Kendall, what do you mean by 101%? <laughs> the scale we use is the, is the Kansas City uh, cardiomyopathy scale, and it goes to 100. And before a patient uh, entered into this, their scale was 33. And afterwards, we resurveyed them they've risen to 67. That's how we got 101%. And finally, for self-efficacy, they improved by 6%. So as a researcher, I get excited about this. But as a clinician, I get even more excited about what the patient said. They said, well, this is the best I felt in two years. Uh, this is the longest I've so stayed out of hospital. I may not want TELUS, which is a company who provide us with technology in the door to collect the equipment, or people who have not seen me for a while uh, tell me, well, what a difference. Uh, even your voice is stronger. Uh, 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 oh, yeah, the, all right. so, so in that sense, it was, uh, it was a good positive feasibility study. And so we embarked on a randomized controlled trial with 21 communities. And so we've just finished enrolling patients and uh, we're currently analyzing our data. And we're hoping to see if the randomized controlled trial further support the data that we have and more importantly, to look at are there variations in urban places like Vancouver, in regional places like Victoria, Kelowna, or in rural and remote places like Fort St. John? Do they use it differently? And are there different effects that we can see? And so you may say, well, yeah, it's a great study. It's a clinical study. Well, it may not be that great, depending on the outcome of a random control trial. What does it have to do with AI and machine learning? Now, I don't, I, don't, I don't do stock market. I don't know stock market. <laughs> but for the people who are in the stock market, they tell me, you know, it's not only important that you look at stock prices. You got to look at a whole bunch of numbers because the wisdom is in the numbers. So in addition to stock prices, you, look at, you need to look at the price earning ratio. That's going to be a very important ratio. And you look at the market index, especially not just the average index, but for the company that you invest, look at the index for that type of company is your company outperforming others or not? So a whole bunch of number on and on and on. But I would submit to you that 
if we use that in medicine, I think it would be very, very helpful. Back to the tech for home, we were using humans to look at the different sensors, blood pressure, heart rate, tiredness, and then we synthesize in our mind, is the patient doing better? And if not, we should intervene. But are there stories in the numbers that we can use? Here's one patient uh, that we see. So you can see that you know, 90 days post-discharge, the top one is weight. Uh, and that's great, it's the, the person's losing weight, which is what we want. Uh, and these are fluid weights. And also we look at their blood pressure and say, you know, are their blood pressure under control? So overall, the variability of blood pressure has decreased. We also look at an index called shock index. And very often in trauma, we look at this, the pulse divided by systolic blood pressure. And usually that number, the higher, it means more critical. And so we try to use that number in this group of patients. And then you can see the bottom curve is about the shock index. Again, overall, you can see a decrease. So all of them are in a good trend. The fourth curve is oxygen saturation, which is remaining in a fairly normal uh, bracket, 94% above. We also look at, uh, in, this, in this plotting, the whether they saw a family doctor or um, so saw a doctor or they have heart failure that needs hospitalization and whether they feel fatigue. And so let's look at a particular point in this graph. Uh, for example, here with fatigue. Uh, when you look at that particular slice of data, something interesting emerged. You can see that, for example, the weights is continuing to decrease, but for that particular day, the heart rates went above 100. On that particular day when she feel fatigue, that the shock index uh, was on a little bit of rise, and in fact, a bit of a peak at the shock index. The oxygen saturation remains about in the normal zone. And so on that day, the person felt fatigue and you can see that in two days time, the person need to go to emergency. And so if we think about having this kind of slice and be able to look at this patient and say, well, at that point of fatigue, we should actually start intervening. Don't wait till the person's short of breath and then go to emergency. And we can manage the patient. That would be amazing. And so I think the data can help us to try to achieve that. Let me illustrate with a different study. Uh, this is uh, after our four-year study, we we're able to gain a three-year grant to look at high blood pressure in how do we manage high blood pressure. Now, it may not surprise you uh, that it's, it's a bit of a conundrum for us in emergency to treat high blood pressure, especially if the patient doesn't have symptoms, except maybe dizziness, uh, but the patient's not having heart attacks. The question is, do we treat that blood pressure or not? We know that there's a phenomenon. If a person sees a doctor, we call it white coat syndrome, the blood pressure goes up. Also, emergency department is very stressful. So when they come in, you know, is this really high blood pressure or it's just an abnormal number? And so the problem for us is, do we treat or not to treat? And we can commit two types of error. The error of omission. Let's not treat... <laughs> Why don't you go home, follow up your family doctor in seven days? What if that was truly a high blood pressure, 180 over 100, 190 over 120? There is also the potential error of commission. If we treat, but the patient goes home, the blood pressure normalizes, and the, blood, the patient still takes blood pressure pill, the blood pressure may drop to the point that the patient faints and come back to emergency. And so what we do is we send patients home with blood pressure, heart rates, and use an app to track the blood pressure to see what's the natural course of that patient. And so in fact, that not only help us to understand the course of the patient, does it stay high, in which case it need to treat, goes back to normal, which we don't need to treat, or they're partially elevated that we still need to treat. And it gives us the advantage to triage them faster to a hypertension clinic. In fact, there was a patient who was discharged with high blood pressure and over 24 to 48 hours, saw the blood pressure stay high. And we brought them back to hypertension clinic and her kidney was starting to fail in two days compared to two days ago. And if we didn't have the study, that person would have gone seen the family doctor in seven days, not sure where the blood pressure, uh, not sure if they would take blood tests and we may miss that particular case. And so this would be another illustration of how once we monitor the data and the data can help us decide to look at ways of making decisions. 
very fortunate. I got to, to know Professor Kelvin Soy, a, a, um, a professor data scientist at Chinese U Hong Kong, very enterprising, very knowledgeable and very excellent uh, 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 researcher. And we're working together on a project that he's been a uh, champion leading on blood pressure, uh, looking at Hong Kong community cohorts and the SPRINT cohort, which is a cohort that North American use uh, for our hypertension guideline. So with the patients, we're looking at this cohort of patients. Can we make some sense out of numbers? We know that for patients with blood pressure, variability, that's high. They have more risk of stroke and heart failure. So your blood pressure 120, 80, if they keep maintaining it, it's good. If it's 140, 90, it's hypertension. But if it keeps going up and down, 210 over 140, and then drop back down to 120 over 80, and then go back up to 160 over 90, that variability introduced more risk. Now we can statistically chop them in quantiles and we found that if we do so, 33% in those cohort will be found to have high blood pressure variability. But with Professor Choi applying the machine learning, the K-means approach, that we were able to isolate 14% with high blood pressure variability with high risk. And so from a screening point of view in population health, we actually decrease the number of people at risk by half and treat those patients well. Again, a population health use of data to improve care. And then this is a, another recent example of atrial fibrillation that I work with my cardiologist at UBC. We look at atrial fibrillation being a very common arrhythmia. And of course, if we don't treat, uh, the risk of stroke is high. And so ablation, burning the heart, either using cold or using heat, uh, there's a 50 to 70% success rate to control the heart rate back down. But the question is, how do you predict success? They published a study called Circa Dose, and they look at six month marker of success. But is there a way that we can predict earlier whether it's success or not? Do we need to wait six months? And so we went to the data again, and we found that there's an index called heart rate variability. In fact, many people with watches now, they actually measure heart rate variability. If we take a deep breath now, our heart rate would slow down and we breathe out, our heart rate goes up. So it's a very natural phenomenon. In fact, it's controlled by an autonomic nervous system. And the whole point of ablation is actually to decrease the autonomic response of the heart. And so we found that with heart rate variability, the blue being the male curve and the red being the female curve, that after ablation, we see a significant decrease in heart rate variability. In fact, heart rate variability turns out to be a very good predictor especially early on, whether it's gonna be success or not before six months. And that has a whole bunch of implications about you know, when do you stop therapies? When do you stop medications? Or where cases where you need to restart medications earlier on? And so again, we were able to publish on that particular study. Let me turn a little bit to the future where we're working right now. And I know that uh, uh, Ms. Oi will be speaking about telehealth. The nice thing about virtual care and telehealth, using something what we do now in seeing patients, it's great that we get to talk with them, but we don't get their vital signs. If I look at the patient, I don't know what that person's blood pressure is. But we're very fortunate to be working with the National Research Council in Canada to look at how do we carry out touchless sensing so that we can support our patients despite the fact that when looking at them, we talking to them, uh, we may not know the vital signs but can we use touchless sensing to start detecting their blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturation, and start to use data analytics to help us in telehealth? This is another study where we are having a commercial uh, application in uh, using okay. robot to actually do auscultations of stethoscope. And so in cases where you have isolation, maybe in a nursing home, if we place a robot there, easily cleanable, but when we do virtual care, the robot can also use this to collect data for us. And again, we can do telehealth better. We can also collect data uh, to evaluate it. We've set up our emergency department into a living laboratory so that for every patient that comes in over the last two years, we're able to start asking, do you mind if we borrow a little bit of your time to test some of our sensors, wearables and data? And so this is a collaboration between our hospital 
our merchant hospital administration, our emergency department, and our unit for research. We focus on three areas. Artificial intelligence is definitely one, virtual health, and finally digital medicine. And really is to improve the operations, improve patient flow, and also improve patients and health professional experiences. And we're now focusing on the use of 5G as a network for emergency. It's great that we have sensors, it's great that we have data, but how do we transport the data faster? How do we get the data in the cloud? How do we analyze them faster in real time, give it back to us? And so with 5G on the bottom left, it's not only the enhanced broadband. You know, we talk about, you can download a whole theater movie in four seconds. Great, fantastic. Uh, we can use that for data download. The top left, low latency. The whole point of autonomous driving is so that it can react to things real fast. In cardiac arrest, we need to have that low latency. Massive machine to machine communication so that we can actually have display signals in multiple patients at multiple times and network slicing so that we can actually use that the network so that in concentrating on slice, it won't slow down a different slice in doing that. I'm gonna conclude in about two minutes, but before I do so though, I don't wanna give you an impression that it's all roses and there's no downside. Uh, I'm just gonna introduce this a little bit in terms of big data and the five Vs. The volume of data is important. The velocity of the data arriving, the veracity of the data, is it accurate? The variety of data that we have, and finally the value of the data for our population. Um, is the study I do in North America and high blood pressure applicable in Hong Kong, in Malaysia, in New Zealand? Uh, do I have enough patients, variation of population, male, females, uh, different ethnic communities? That equity, diversity, inclusion. Are my data inadvertently marginalized certain groups? Once we start looking at bigger and bigger data, we start using not only simple machine learning, but we use neural network, it starts to have difficulty explaining. Data get into a black box, spit out some results, and we say, can we explain these results? Explainability, again, a very important area to look at in clinical application. Security, we all know that's very important. And then a more far-reaching question, perhaps. Currently, we use AI to supplement health professionals. For example, use AI to look at an X-ray. If the X-ray screen positive, we don't have to look, we only look at negatives. But one day if AI can detect those better, would humans still need to learn? And even if human learn to distinguish these abnormality, would we still not use that skill? I think those are some of the questions that we need to think about. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I think data is very important in our application in AI and machine learning. This paradigm of sense, think, and act was more than four decades old when we look at uh, robots. Uh, but it has now been applied to gaming. You know, how do you sense a gamer doing certain functions and how do you, in the machine, react back to that particular gamer? We talk about autonomous driving, sensing a person in front of you, thinking fast, and then the, the, the car jam on the brake. In health, how should we take advantage of that sense, think, and act? Imagine if we can actually, for example, uh, with a mobile phone, you open it and said this morning, oh, the weather's fantastic, auction's really fresh, and your heart functioning at 90% of your normal, and so this is a great day for you to go and exercise for 20 minutes. And on a different day, it's kind of muggy out there. Air quality is not that great. Uh, last night you went out for a meal and so you actually retained two pounds. And so today your heart's only functioning about 65%. So you may want to increase your diuretic, fluid restrict relatively and decrease your exercise. Wouldn't that be amazing if that's on your phone? And I think we need to work towards that particular area. And so at the end of the day, not only do we diagnose and treat and capture the data over time and with that, we may then start to have the chance of detecting, detecting illness, like that fatigue example. So we can intervene before the patient needs to go to merge. And we capture that three or four times, we may start to be able to help that person to predict, to say, what do I need to do so that I can prevent heart failure, so that I won't even get into the risk of it. 
And so at the end of the day, I think technology has a lot to do in helping us in healthcare. But at the end of the day, we should not forget that partnership with our patient is going to be very important. The high touch part is important. How can the data not only help us make decisions, but get us closer to partner with our patients? I work from the unit of digital emergency medicine. We look at how do we bridge the gap between hospital and home to keep our patients safe and transition our patients safely. And so you've heard about two of the things that I do in terms of home monitoring and data and records. Uh, I hope that one day I can come back and talk a little bit about virtual care. How do we use it so that we can bring this completeness to support our patient in a safe journey? Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to uh, the interaction and uh, um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, uh, Kendall, uh, for the excellent uh, lecture and also uh, keeping time. Uh, I, I, I think I can speak for the uh, audience uh, that we all feel the passion and the energy going into the digital health in action uh, in the programs. And uh, you also uh, highlighted or anticipated some of the issues. If we want to move further forward, uh, further on, uh, for instance, into machine learning, actually using AI in decision making and guiding the application. So we'll uh, leave those points uh, to the comments and discussions perhaps. And if I uh, can now proceed to introduce uh, Dr. Kenny Oi. Um, Kenny, uh, I met her uh, in an Australian, Australian conference in biotechs uh, two, two years ago uh, in Dunedin and uh, share a lot of uh, discussions and thoughts on uh, the challenges of um, regulating and uh, making guidelines for professionals uh, on telehealth and other uh, areas. Uh, so I decided to invite her to uh, share a little bit with us on uh, her thoughts in this area. Uh, Kenny is a senior policy advisor and researcher at the Medical Council of New Zealand. Uh, a significant part of her role involves researching and writing standards for doctors. Uh, she regularly advises doctors and the public on Medical Council of New Zealand standards and guidelines and helps facilitate the consumer advisory group. I think they, they, do, did a really, they do a really excellent job in consumer and uh, patient and public engagement in, uh, present, in writing up their guidelines. And uh, she enjoys uh, uh, her, her work and, uh, in formulating for policies that encourage uh, good medical practice and communication between doctors and patients. Now in 2020, she wrote the Medical Council of New Zealand's telehealth statement uh, and discussion paper on when AI is involved in the care of patients. Uh, I really recommend the uh, audience to uh, take a look uh, uh, from uh, internet on the telehealth um, statement. Uh, this is at once a guideline for professionals and also uh, I think an educational tool for the public to understand the expectations and standards uh, in telehealth. Um, as, a, as background, she, her background is in the uh, Bachelor of Property and Bachelor of Laws from uh, Auckland, and she has a Master of Bioethics and Health Law from the U of Otago. Uh, so uh, she, today she is going to share with us her thoughts on managing uncertainty when AI is used in healthcare. So Kenny, over to you. Thank you. So I'm just, um, just bear with me while I um, bring up my slides. So Kiara Koto, Salam Sajatra, Chosan, Dai Gaho. Thank you first to um, Dr. Derek Al for inviting me to present um, and also for, to Ms. Joey So for organizing the webinar. I understand that tomorrow is a public holiday for Hong Kong. So for those of you who are celebrating Mid-Autumn Festival, I'd like to take this opportunity to say, Zong Chao Tit Fai Lo. My name is Kenny Ui, and I'm a senior policy advisor and researcher at the Medical Council of New Zealand. Now, unlike Dr. Kendall Ho, I'm not a clinician, so I don't have firsthand experience of using AI in a clinical setting. I'm going to shift gears by speaking from a non-clinician perspective. I'm going to focus on uncertainty, which is an inherent part of medicine, and suggest some ways to manage uncertainty when doctors use AI in the care of patients. My talk will re reflect a few sources. First, from researching and writing standards for doctors in New Zealand, where I've come to learn what good medical practice is. 
And secondly, from facilitating discussions with our consumer advisory group, which is one of medical council's stakeholders, where patients tell me firsthand what matters to them in healthcare. And thirdly, from writing a discussion paper for the medical council on the use of AI. Now, having said that, the views that I'll be expressing are my own. Here's an overview of what we will be covering. I'll start by considering what uncertainty is in a medical context and why it's important to recognize that uncertainty exists in medicine. That provides the ground for the third section of my talk, which is to look at some suggestions for managing uncertainty when AI is used in healthcare. I'll also touch briefly on Watson Health, IBM Watson Health, which ties together a number of points in my talk. So first, what do I mean by uncertainty in a medical context? Well, like all aspects of complex behavior, medicine is an inexact science where the outcome is nonlinear. So there'll always be some unknowns in every clinical encounter. For example, a doctor may specialize in treating certain clinical conditions and have many years of experience in doing so. But this does not necessarily mean that the doctor knows for sure that they have made the right diagnosis for the patient in front of them or that the, that the treatments that the doctor is recommending will work for that particular patient. Some of that uncertainty remains even when AI is used in the patient's care. So in other words, you can never eliminate uncertainty entirely in medicine. I first became interested in uncertainty in medicine after reading a British medical journal paper by Dr. Matt Morgan, an intensivist or intensive care consultant in Wales. In that paper, Dr. Morgan talked about what he considered to be the three most important words in medicine. And none of those three words are medical, me medical terms. You're likely to have used them in your conversations at home and at work. And very coincidentally, it also works out to three words in Cantonese. So I'll pause here for a minute. If you'd like to guess what those three words are, feel free to type your answers in the chat room function, either in English or Chinese. I seem to have um, lost the chat function, so I can't seem to find it. And so apologies yeah. if you are typing the answers. I can't seem to see it. So can, um, I might can, have to call someone. I can do a summary for you. Okay, uh, if you can. Uh, some some Thank interesting you. thoughts. Uh, one Thank says, you. I am sorry. <laughs> a few words. Uh, a few of them uh, got, I don't know. Uh, some, a few of them said quality and safety. Uh, some one professionalism, ethics and love. Do no harm. That's a good one, I thought. So that gives you a, 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 a feeling for what people have been typing. So um, thanks everyone for um, typing your answers. And for those of you who um, say, I don't know, or Norm G, as you say in Cantonese, that is the correct answer, according to Dr. Morgan. Now the answer to the previous slide may surprise you. I don't know is underused in medicine, but when it is used, it can be powerful and effective. I think it's underused because patients and their families often expect doctors to have answers to all their to, to have answers to their questions about their health and their condition. And it can be hard for patients to appreciate that doctors have to contend with uncertainty and that making a diagnosis may not be straightforward. And even when a doctor makes a diagnosis, the doctors may still not be entirely certain about how that condition should be treated or managed. And it can also be challenging for doctors to explain that they can't cure or treat every disease. So doctors do have a role in managing patients' expectations by being honest and open about aspects that the doctor may not be sure about. Honesty and openness facilitates dialogue and conversations with the patient. And this in turn helps patients to understand that medicine does have a degree of uncertainty and that, that that uncertainty cannot be eliminated even when AI is used in medicine. 
Now that we've established that uncertainty is an inherent part of medicine, I'll discuss some ways to manage uncertainty when AI is used in the patient's care. I'll cover six suggestions, but these are by no means exhaustive. The first is, that it, is that it's important to recognize and identify one's own cognitive bias. So what do I mean by cognitive bias? Well, cognitive bias refers to the way someone understands events, facts, and other people based on, based on one's views, beliefs, and life experience. Cognitive bias affects everyone, including doctors. For example, doctors are trained to recognize patterns by identifying certain clinical signs and symptoms. And while these are this quick thinking heuristics or mental shortcuts is useful, especially in an acute or time pressured setting, it can also expose doctors to cognitive bias when a patient does not fit a particular pattern that the doctor is expecting. And as a consequence, doctors could overlook perhaps more subtle signs and symptoms or misjudge the clinical situation. I think acknowledging cognitive bias is, a, is an important starting point when AI is used in the patient's care, because that bias can influence how a doctor manages each clinical encounter. For example, a doctor could focus on certain information that support, supports their presumed diagnosis, but downplay or disregard other information. And to tackle cognitive bias, reflection is valuable. Regularly examining one's views, values, beliefs, and why they drive a particular course of action. Ideally, that self-examination should occur on an ongoing basis, re recording those reflections, and sharing them with a trusted colleague or peer. Secondly, resist viewing artificial intelligence as a panacea or silver bullet for healthcare. Of course, advancements in medicine do improve the sensitivity and specificity of what can be investigated, and it also enables earlier detection of diseases. It does push the boundaries of what is possible in medicine but that in turn can make it harder for, doctor, for patients and doctors to appreciate that medicine has its limits and that not every disease or symptom can be treated and cured. And this line of thinking can also pervade into healthcare AI in that even though AI is capable of assessing complex data at impressive speed and volume, it's important to remember that AI is only one aspect of the health ecosystem. In that even if AI could di diagnose, and diagnose a disease much earlier, in order for healthcare to work effectively, you still need to communicate that information clearly and effectively with the patient. You still need good coordination of care and effective teamwork and collaboration between the healthcare professionals involved in the patient's care. Often it is these functions done consistently and continually over a period of time that result in a better health outcome for the patient compared to one-off procedures. Thirdly, it's important to recognize AI's capabilities and limitations. AI is particularly suitable for identifying clini clinical patterns in large, high-dimensional data sets and classifying that data into, into outcomes. To date, AI has been used successfully in image-intensive specialties such as cardiology, ophthalmology, radiology, and pathology. It's easier to train AI for clear and defined tasks. But AI might, it might be more challenging to use AI in, in, in aspects of healthcare where there is a relational element. This is because AI, it's harder for AI to pick up ambiguities or subtle clues such as body language that a human doctor would notice. It's also harder to train AI on unstructured, abbreviated and subjective information such as a, doc, such as a doctor's notes and hospital discharge summaries. Not just as cognitive bias can affect humans, AI could also amplify and reinforce human biases if the input data set is biased. And we heard a bit about that in the last talk. Or AI could, recommend, could make recommendations that are technically correct, but misinterpret the clinical scenario 
especially if the input data lacks context. So it's important to evaluate the recommendations that AI generates. But assessing AI's reliability can be challenging because doctors may not always have control over the data set that was fed into the AI tool. And it can also be difficult to, discover, to uncover and understand AI's inner logic or what we call the black box. Now I'm not saying that the black box is inherently bad, but rather that it could introduce another layer of uncertainty when it is used in the patient's care. Fourthly, doctors have a role in helping patients understand that uncertainty will always be part of medicine. That uncertainty could be compounded when AI is part of the care journey. For some patients, it could be hard to trust a machine, especially if that machine generates recommendations that are difficult to understand, yet has far-reaching implications for the patient. Care and trust are something that, are clo that is closely connected. So patients are more likely to engage with their doctor if they know that their doctor is someone that they can be honest and open with, even if that doctor may not have answers to all their questions. And while being honest and open with patients and acknowledging that there may be things you are not sure about, while that may leave a doctor feeling vulnerable, for many patients, that, that is important and perhaps more important than getting an answer to that, than getting answers to every clinical question that they may have. So good bedside man manner, including making time to listen to the patient and to support them through their care journey is, will, become, will become even more important as medicine becomes increasingly high tech. Fifthly, it's important to involve patients in treatment decisions when there are aspects of care that, the, especially when there are aspects of care that the doctor may not be sure may not be sure about, something to be mindful of is when medicine is high tech. It's not to assume that the computer knows best or better. Um, so it's important not to defer to a machine, but to check its assumptions and recommendations. And while a data set may reflect the decisions of a large number of patients, it still may not reflect how a particular patient would have decided or that, pat or that patient's preferences um, and wishes if you, if, you do, if you don't know what matters to that patient. So it's important for doctors to give patients the opportunity to ask questions and to e express their views and concerns about the AI tool that is involved in their care. Engaging patients and involving them in treatment decisions is one way to help keep healthcare personalized and ensures that patients remain the focus of care. My sixth and last suggestion is for doctors to cultivate a degree of tolerance and uncertainty, a, a degree of tolerance and acceptance of uncertainty in medicine. This is especially important given the rapid advancements in AI. As discussed earlier, doctors themselves do need to be comfortable and to accept that uncertainty will always be part of medicine and that not every clinical problem will have a solution or an answer. And even when AI does add to the clinical picture and provide doctors with more information, that additional information does not necessarily warrant that more investigations or treatment for the patient. It's actually important to remember that there could be pitfall, pitfalls in overtreatment, for, including the risk of errors and complications. It's also important to remember that every clinical decision is also a resource decision, and we know that health resources are finite. So doctors do need to steward health resources effectively and wisely, especially in an era where high-tech medicine often demands that more should be done for the patient. I'll now touch briefly on IBM Watson Health, which ties together a number of points that I've made so far. The background to this is that in 2006, David Ferrucci, then a scientist at IBM, wanted to develop a supercomputer that could win question and answer games. So Watson was programmed to identify word patterns and predict correct answers. Why it was called Watson is that it was named after IBM's founder, Thomas J. Watson. 
In 2011, Watson defeated two human champions in a game show called Jeopardy. And the very next day, IBM announced that Watson's skills would be applied to healthcare, law, finance, and academia. Watson would use a cloud-based system to gather and process big data to de deliver insights and recommendations. It was going to be a solution for lots of things. And specifically, Watson's natural language processing capabilities would be applied to medicine and would revolutionize cancer care. In 2012, IBM signed an agreement with Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And that was the birth of Watson Health. Further collaborations followed with other prominent medical institutions such as the Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, and Veterans Affairs, to name a few. Effectively, IBM was looking for medical institutions that had access to that had big that had big amounts of data that I, that Watson could mine and process. But the, pro, the, but the products that emerged from, what, from Watson were far from brilliant. They were more like AI assistants that could only perform routine tasks. Watson struggled with the basics of learning different types of cancer, and it couldn't mine patients' information from electronic health records, and it struggled to make sense of patients' notes and their histories. Over time, several partners ended their collaboration with Watson. For example, in 2017, the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center ended uh, their collaboration with Watson, and that was after spending 62 million US with no tangible results. And in 2020, Memorial Sloan Kettering ended their collaboration. As of today, IBM is looking to sell Watson Health. So what went wrong? I think there are a number of lessons from IBM Watson Health on the, on the challenges of using AI in patient care. First, IBM sought to create waves and to revolutionize healthcare, but these big, big scale goals were unrealistic. Remember that Watson was originally custom built for a quiz show. I think IBM underestimated the complexity of a project that was meant to improve cancer care. And cancer care goes much more than diagnosis and treatment. There are also wider factors to think about, such as the patient's wishes and goals, the impact of the illness on the patient and their family, the accessibility and availability of the treatment in the locality that the patient is based. Secondly, re replicating a human doctor's expertise is complex. Algorithms are often developed in controlled environments which may not necessarily reflect the reality of the clinical environment that doctors find themselves in. It's important for the AI to complement a doctor's uh, it's important for the AI to complement existing workflows rather than to add to the heavy workload that doctors already contend with. It's also important to ask how doctors will use the AI and implement that in their everyday practice. Thirdly, any recommendation that AI generates needs to be reliable and relevant. In the case of Watson for Oncology, which was the, what was, which was the product that um, was developed with Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, it was, trained on, Watson, it was trained on a few hypothetical scenarios devised by doctors at Memorial Sloan Kettering instead of using actual patient outcomes. So effectively, Watson's suggestions were based on a few doctors' preferences and not insights from analyzing real cases. Of course, the population at Memorial Sloan Kettering is an, is an affluent population, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the diversity of patients around the world. Watson was used in a number of countries, including Thailand, India, and South Korea. And many doctors complained that Watson's advice was unreliable it was biased towards American patients and American methods of care. Yet IBM failed to acknowledge complaints about Watson's performance. Fourth, it's important to remember that any recommendation that AI generates reflects a moment in time, but those recommendations could affect the patient for life 
and there's a lot at stake if the recommendations made are incorrect. In the case of Watson for Oncology, it didn't base its recommendations on patients' outcomes, but on, a, on doctors' preferences at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And, what, and Watson for Oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering had a traffic light system where the top recommendation was green, orange for alternative um, options, and red for not recommended. But I don't know that diagnosing and treating cancer, can, can, it's, so sim it's so simple that you can reduce it to a traffic light system. And even if you did agree with the top recommendation, in the case where there is where it recommends radical surgery for a patient, it does mean removing a body part or an organ, and, that, and that's the only um, body part or organ that the patient has, which of course um, that then does have flow-on effects for the patient, such as the risk of complications during and post-surgery, time off work, caregiving responsibilities for the family, and the need for follow-up care. So some thoughts as I close my talk. Uncertainty is an inherent part of medicine and some, some of that uncertainty will remain no matter how skilled or experienced the doctor is. And even when AI is used and could add more information to the clinical picture. And because uncertainty will always be part of any healthcare environment, whether or not AI is used, it's important that doctors manage that uncertainty by examining their own biases and ensuring that any results or recommendations generated from the systems that they used are verified. Finally, something that my consumer advisory group members regularly remind me about, ensure that the patient remains central. Never forget that it is because there are patients to care for that you have the word care in healthcare. I think it would be regrettable if healthcare became mechanical and impersonal at, that as a result of advancements such that doctors spend much more time trying to understand a machine compared to the time that they spend with their patients. And that concludes my talk. Thank you for listening to me, Doche. Thank you, Kenny, uh, for a very, very rich talk, which I thought uh, carries a lot of humanistic perspective and reflections uh, that can be put for, for, for and further discussion. Uh, now, let me just uh, very quickly introduce the uh, two uh, discussions uh, or commentators. Uh, Professor Joseph Song uh, probably needs no introduction to audience in Hong Kong. He was a very beloved uh, leader of our university uh, for many years uh, before he uh, moved on to his uh, new role in Singapore. Uh, he, uh, by training, is a gastroenterologist of really international acclaim, and he is a commission uh, in the Chinese Academy of Engineering uh, in China. Uh, he served as, uh, as I said, Vice Chancellor and President of the Chinese University uh, from 2010 to 2017, and he is presently still an uh, emeritus professor in medicine of CHK. Uh, he has published over a thousand uh, scientific articles. Um, in medical journals and uh, scientific journals and uh, listed as the highly uh, cited researchers uh, for the year 2018 uh, to 2020. Uh, he has written books, chapters, uh, and many, many uh, other academic uh, writings. Professor uh, Dean of the uh, Lee Conscient School of Medicine at Nanyang uh, Technic uh, Technological University of Singapore. Uh, and uh, we very much look forward to his comments. Uh, next, may I introduce uh, Professor Gilberto Leung. Uh, Professor Gilberto Leung is a longtime friend as well. Um, is a new surgeon, a clinical professor, an educator, and also the endowed uh, Chang Wen Heng Professorship in clinical neuroscience at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, he graduated from UK, uh, the St. Bartholomew Hospital in New London, and also has an intercalated BSc in physical anthropology from uh, UCL. Uh, during training, he was awarded uh, gold medals uh, from uh, Harold uh, Gold Medal, and also he is in uh, the uh, Dr. Miller Medal at Royal College of Surgeons in London. Uh, he joined uh, Hong Yu in 2005. Uh, he's presently 
the president of the Hong Kong Academy of Medicine uh, and the associate dean uh, teaching and learning of uh, the Hong Kong youth faculty. Uh, he has uh, published uh, more than 170 articles, uh, uh, 11 book chapters, monographs, conference papers, publications, and other invited lectures. Uh, so may I now uh, first invite uh, Professor Joseph Song uh, to share with us your thoughts and uh, thinkings after uh, listening to the two presentations. Thank you, Derek, and uh, good morning, everyone from Singapore. Um, I uh, enjoyed the talk by Kendall and Kenny just now. Uh, one uh, depicts the picture of how uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence can be used in a clinical setting. And Kenny has pointed out uh, from the ethical and the legal and social aspects. And I just want to tell you that um, the reason why I come to Singapore is really because technology and medicine uh, is a good match here uh, in this city country. Uh, they have put in a lot of resources into development of technology and try to see how it can help uh, particularly for the aging population in Singapore and many other countries. And in this picture, uh, it shows the building uh, where I'm uh, situated. Uh, this is the Lee Kong Chen School of Medicine. It's a, the school is only 10 years old, but this building is 100 years old. And I welcome you to come to visit me uh, if you pass by uh, Singapore. Um, <clears throat> I like to point out, uh, as uh, Kendall did, that AI will impact uh, medicine in a big way, but at least at three different levels. From a clinician's level, it helps us to make rapid and accurate um, imaging uh, and, and diagnosis. On the healthcare system, uh, it will help us to improve our efficiency and uh, decide which patient needs to be hospitalized, which needs to be going into the ICU and so on. And finally, also work on individual level where we uh, empower our patient and their relative to look after themselves, to change lifestyle, preventing diseases, and also to take care of our own health data. But as already pointed out by Kenny, there are many issues yet uh, in, 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 in implementation of artificial intelligence in medicine. And the first one is trust. Can we trust a machine to make life and death decision for ourselves and for our patient. And uh, trust uh, is difficult to gain, especially when we have all our data uh, being collected and uh, whether this data really represents myself or it just represents certain part of the population where the AI tool was developed, whether my data is securely um, <clears throat> stored and not to be uh, used by um, some unintended purposes, uh, and also whether the data is um, uh, ethically used. So uh, a lot of people, uh, when, when we come to um, uh, blood taking and doing genomic tests, do have these questions. So where is this data going to be used? And the other uh, reasons for uh, having um, trust issue is that uh, really the computer is often smarter than we do. And a lot of uh, machine learning and neural network system can actually produce some uh, diagnosis or prediction of outcomes of diagnosis that we don't simply understand. There is no biological mechanisms that can explain why the conclusion is like this. And therefore uh, we have created so-called black box medicine, something that it looks like a black box to me, but it comes out with certain solution. And with this hidden pattern in clinical diagnosis and management, are we going to lay our um, lives in the hands of a machine um, that even my doctors do not understand? So I just point out that uh, we will need to work on how to make AI uh, more secure and more, and make uh, some of the process uh, of decision more transparent. And second part of it is really on the social aspects because uh, we will have uh, a lot of uh, machines working with us, particularly for the elderly population. But what is the feeling of patients being talked and being uh, uh, taken care of, if you like, 
by machine instead of human beings. When you go to see a doctor, it happens that the doctor is actually just a piece of uh, machine uh, instead of something with uh, warm blood and, and a good heart, uh, whether or not we feel um, uh, that we have been well taken care of. And there is certain human side of medicine that cannot be replaced. I think uh, human dignities and social isolation, uh, it's another issue. So the feeling of doctors as well as patients is still very apprehensive about using um, AI uh, and machines learn for our decisions. And then there is this legal issues that somebody has pointed out um, when the machine or the robot um, make decisions or even operate on us, uh, and, and did something wrong, whose responsibility is this? Are we going to sue the machine or sue the company or sue the hospital or sue the doctor who actually allowed the machine to operate on me? The legal side of this um, uh, aspect of medicine is not very well to work out. And I have been having the opportunity to work with some lawyers uh, on this. And uh, we all feel that much more discussion and government's policy and framework needs to be established. So I think uh, in the, at the end of the day, uh, we, what we like is to have AI assisted medicine instead of AI driven medicine. We don't want our life and fate be sealed by a machine, but they do help us to uh, make decisions. So it's like a driverless car that perhaps we want to have still a steering wheel that when the car is moving by itself and uh, making directions where to go to, uh, when things goes wrong, we still have a steering wheel and we still have a brake to step in and to um, uh, uh, um, control over the machine. Otherwise, uh, um, things can be disastrous. But I think at the end of the day, as Charles Darwin said, we need to adapt to the changes of life in order for us to survive. So here I want to introduce you to a book written by Eric Topol called Deep Medicine. I think many of you have written it. He talks about the three Ds in medicine, which we are now facing, digitization, democratization, that is to release all the, that is all the data of patients' care is actually in the hands of the patients very much uh, so in many countries. So doctors do not play God anymore that uh, we know everything and we desire everything and it's just explain a little bit to our patients. No, we cannot do that. And finally, the deep learning technology. But will all this D translate into better health care and uh, come with a better, better clinical outcome we still do not know. And at this moment, I'm doing a literature search on all the paper published on AI uh, in different specialties in medicine. Out of over 10,000 papers, there are only 37 randomized controlled studies being conducted uh, that compare AI-assisted diagnosis or treatment versus a standard of care. And uh, I would tell you that less than half of them actually prove that they are better than human-driven medicine. That is what we are practicing right now. So we need a lot more efforts uh, from uh, Kendall and many other workers uh, like him to produce evidence to gain our confidence on AI-assisted care. But if that works, then our healthcare system should be much better because uh, then we should pay more attention to our patients instead of talking to the machine. Uh, when I was in Hong Kong, I remember when we do rounds in the morning, everybody was looking at the computer in front of us. Everybody was checking on the iPad, but nobody looked at the patient. But we should not forget that at the end of the day, uh, it is the patients that we are looking after. This is a study from Indiana when patients were asked about how do they feel about doctors, rushed, hurry, busy, arrogant, unconcerned. And although more money is spent in the United States from 1975 to 2019, but the care is not at least perceived to be better than 
uh, before when we don't have the computer. So how can doctors and nurses and healthcare workers work with the machine to make better care? It's very important. So I'll stop here, but to conclude that we need connections between doctors and patients with our machines. We need not just deep phenotyping, deep learning, but also deep empathy to make better healthcare. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Joseph. Uh, that's excellent. Uh, may I now uh, invite uh, Professor Gilberto Lan to make his remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Derek, for inviting me here. Uh, thank you, uh, speakers, colleagues, and Professor Sung for uh, your wonderful elaborations on this very important topic. As I mentioned before the meeting, the Academy is um, looking at the issue of AI and how um, doctors in Hong Kong can embrace it, work at it, work on it, and work with it uh, in the future, uh, especially uh, in regard to training uh, and how we can equip um, our next generations uh, to, to work on with at the um, AI. Now, I, I noticed a few very interesting points that uh, have been raised by um, Kendo and, and Kenny. Uh, maybe I just want to expand on those a little bit. One thing is about equity. Um, Kendo, your, your system, it's um, very smart, um, very elaborate, but I don't know whether uh, this could mostly be used or picked up by people who are more educated, probably more affluent. Are we talking about potential inequity here in terms of access? Uh, here, artificial intelligence is, I think, revolutionizing um, the concept of access in healthcare in a big way. Uh, we're not talking about geographical distance now. We are talking about um, the ability to handle and, and, and work with um, devices, the ability to afford them, to the ability or willingness to follow advices generated by big data and deep learning. Um, so I just thought that this is something we can get into, especially in Hong Kong, where we are talking about a, a, a huge uh, discrepancy, uh, you know, the, the, the Guinea index, um, et cetera. So I, I thought that's something, you know, um, it's worth looking into, at least, you know, from, from uh, Academy's point of view. The, the other uh, point is about responsibility. We can talk about um, doctors' responsibility, but at the same time, now we are also looking at um, the patient's responsibility. How much should a patient um, uh, uh, hold himself responsible uh, when you are having these sort of devices of remote access, remote uh, recommendations from doctors or from a machine? And at the same time, um, I just also want to explore how this might change doctors' ownership and responsibility of their decisions and recommendations. Because like in the old days when, uh, for me, a neurosurgeon, you, you look at a CT scan and your decisions, diagnosis, treatment would basically rely on the uh, CT scan. Uh, people pay less and less attention to clinical examination, for example. This is an unfortunate but inevitable trend in medicine. Would the same happen um, with AI, um, would we actually found, uh, be found irresponsible for not consulting a machine? Uh, would we be found liable if we don't follow uh, recommendations from AI? Um, this has already come up uh, in areas like, say, pharmacogenomics. It's not exactly machine learning, but there are people talking about if a patient comes to you with a set of um, um, pharmacogenetics and to say that uh, you should not take aspirin, you should take, you know, Avix, uh, you do not react well to augmentin, you should take, you know, the other antibiotic. Uh, how much should we um, uh, accord weight to this thing and what are the risks if we do or if we do not? Um, and flip it round, um, people keep, so people like to say that uh, patients may not like to interact with, with machine doctors. But um, one can doubt that in the sense that um, my grandfather used to hate going to, well, love going to the bank and he hated um, uh, internet banking. Uh, but I think many of us actually feel more comfortable uh, banking with a machine because there's no, um, per, no, there's no someone looking at your saving, 
how much you own <laughs> the mortgage company, uh, what money you are paying into whose account. Um, and in fact, I think some people had um, done a research a study randomizing uh, computer generated counseling service versus human counselors uh, over the phone. Um, and the result was startling uh, in the sense that many people actually prefer the machine. Now, when we come to a delicate, sensitive situation like you know, in the hospital, when you're unwell, when you're losing dignity, I somehow wonder whether some people would actually prefer to interact with the machine. Now, I'm not disregarding the importance of the human touch, um, the importance of having someone there to listen, someone with blood uh, and brain. Uh, but there are situations, actually, I think um, a machine um, can fulfill functions that uh, uh, human doctors uh, and cannot. And therefore, it, it all comes down to what, what I'm going to do uh, wearing my academy's hat. How am I going to um, introduce all these very complex and evolving concepts to our trainees? or my medical students at Hong Kong UMED. Uh, how can they grow up feeling comfortable with AI? Uh, with AI? How can they interact with very senior doctors who are not comfortable with AI? Uh, how am I going to argue with my professor of medicine uh, saying that you know, his experience is probably not as reliable as uh, the new IBM watch, for example, <laughs> if there is one ever. Um, and how am I going to help my students talk to patients of different ages and generations and educational backgrounds? I think these are the challenges that I would like to pick up, not that I feel I'm ready to, uh, but looking ahead, I think AI is, or machine learning, uh, it's um, inevitable. It's not about saying whether we should or should not, it's about whether is about how um, and how to temper it. And on top of that would be, of course, the regulatory framework. Hong Kong uh, has no regulatory th framework when it comes to this aspect of medicine. And I think it's time that uh, bodies like the academy or the two medical schools or um, and uh, experts like what we have here can work together. Um, the, the question is whether there should be a universal framework or something very local. Um, whether uh, something that works in New Zealand uh, can work in Hong Kong or Singapore, for example. Uh, otherwise, we're going to be talking about many tens and hundreds of regulatory framework, ethical frameworks on AI. Um, and um, when the world is flat, then it, it can become very problematic. Um, so I'll stop here. Uh, I, I welcome question. I would also like to hear from the experts. About yes. the this, is, this is great. Uh, Professor Lam has uh, raised a number of pointed questions, uh, which I think is uh, very much uh, relevant if we seriously want to push ahead with AI and healthcare in future. So uh, may I uh, first invite uh, Dr. Kendall Holt uh, to uh, give some initial response? Yeah, well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, really appreciate it, Professor Sang, Professor Leung. You raised some really uh, excellent and very, very insightful points. Maybe I'll pick up on three of them. I know that there are some time limitations, so I'll just focus on those. But uh, hopefully it will also help with a larger context. Uh, Professor Sang, you talked about the, the, the trust AI work with AI and share responsibility AI. Absolutely fantastic way to look at that framework. Uh, in my participation in Health Canada, uh, the kind of FDA equivalent in Health Canada, that's very exactly the points that policymakers are figuring out. How do I make sure that can I approve an AI protocol? Can I introduce that safely into practice? And how do I ongoing monitoring of that? It comes back to, in some ways, Ronald Reagan said, you know, trust and verify. And so the question is, how do we start the validation of the initial data sets? And also how do we have post market survey and surveillance to continue to periodically test the validity of it? Because if you change some codes, if you change a data set, how do we know that it continue to apply? And then also how do we in some ways demystify the black box? 
And there are certain ways that uh, in, in computer science and data science that they can do, for example, random computation in some ways in segmental demystify, demystify the black box. How do we continue to use those types of techniques? Whereas for medication approval, it's more like a you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, and post-market survey. Mm -hmm. I think for the software as a service or AI or ML, I think it's important upfront to test but I think the post-market survey become more and more and more important as it goes over time. So that'll be a really interesting area to survey. I do want to also go to Professor Lauren. I absolutely agree. Equity is going to be so important. I think we are in AI in clinical care emergency anyways. It's really testing what's possible. But to scale it up, to really spread it, I think equitable is going to be very important. And so, for example, for our 5G network, we're now looking at low-cost sensors. And in fact, sensors that, you know, uh, if you lose your phone, you feel really bad. But can we actually get to a point where if you even lose the sensors, it's about the line of signals that we really need. And so once you get to that point, the hardware becomes an only an interface. And if we can keep the hardware cost down and really focus on the data, can we make that more equitable, especially when many, many countries are investing in smart cities, smart infrastructures, smart rural health. Um, you know, Elon Musk is inv investing a whole bunch of low flying um, satellites so that rural remote can get data access. How do we ride those waves to increase equity over time with population? Uh, again, you've asked a really, really important question. But let me come back to the, the last one, and that is all of you emphasize and completely agree that data and machine should not separate patients and health professionals, but it should bring us closer together. There are evidence of natural language processing where, in fact, for example, Google use a phone answering service, and in fact, humans can't tell. Actually, it's a machine answering you. So machine empathy is an area of study but we can't make that become a barrier for us to truly have that human touch. And so again, I wanna emphasize on that, but thank you very much. And maybe I'll stop there. I uh, don't wanna take up a lot of time, but hopefully that start to address some of those questions, not to have the answers, but perhaps continue to learn together. Thank, thank you, uh, Kendall. We can come back to uh, some of those points uh, later on. Uh, Kenny, I may now invite you to uh, give some initial response. Um, thank you, um, Professor Sung um, and um, Professor Leong for your insightful comments. Um, I do appreciate that. So um, just really um, to pick up on um, the two, um, on your response, um, you've talked about the importance of trust. Um, and certainly that, that is such a key aspect um, of medicine um, in the doctor-patient relationship. When we um, when we wrote when I wrote the discussion paper for medical council on the use of AI, I mean the, the way we went about was we are we are actually in the early stages of um, developing guidance for doctors, and what we think um, is important, and both of you have brought that out in your um, responses, is really the need the need for good medical practice because at the end of the day, even when when you have when, when you introduce something like um, AI, which some patients could find foreign, it's, it's at the end of the day, patients still want to be able to trust their doctor and they still want to be able to know that the care that they receive is one that's going to be um, just as good. Um, and they also want to know that um, there will still be like that, that things like equity, um, which um, Professor Leong talked about that, that that, that is still going to be important. And for, for us in New Zealand, that, that, is, um, an issue, that is an ongoing issue that we are contending with. A um, lot of questions and not necessarily um, as many answers. Um, in terms of um, the comment about how there are situations where machines can function um, and, and do what doctors perhaps some things that doctors can do. I, I think that is a good point. Um, I, I guess it's a need to think about what it is that machine, like which aspects would patients be comfortable to 
have a machine involved and which areas um, it would be that they, they still want a more um, human aspect. And I guess that that's something to continue thinking about as um, AI develops. So the, the, that's, that's um, my response. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Kenny. Um, may I now uh, open the time uh, for uh, the audience? Uh, so uh, audience, uh, you can, uh, you're invited to type in your questions. Uh, uh, the Zoom also allows raising hands, but I'm not uh, very good with watching all the hands raising. So preferably if you can type in your questions. There is a question uh, from the audience, uh, uh, Kev uh, Kevin Hong, uh, I think uh, from CHK. Uh, that's for uh, Kenny. Uh, and the question is on uh, whether you can share any, personally any regulatory requirements or quality assurance requirements for use of AI in healthcare in New Zealand. Uh, at what stage are you in terms of uh, regulating or providing standards? Sure. Um, thank you, um, Kevin, for that question. So um, as a regulator, the Medical Council regulates doctors and the practice of medicine, but our limitation, so, so we regulate doctors, but when it comes to things like machines or, or even um, the use of medicines, that's actually regulated by another um, government authority called um, Med MedSafe. Um, so currently Med MedSafe or um, Med Medicine Safety, they regulate um, medicines and New Zealand's going through a process where we are reviewing our um, pres prescribing laws. Um, and that we're, we're looking to develop um, a new law called the Thera Therapeutic Products um, it's, it's going to be a legislation that regulates not just medicines, but therapeutic products. And so I guess the big, the question would be, would something like AI come under therapeutic products? And if so, mm. then how, yeah, how, how do you regulate that? So um, that's probably not quite an answer to your question, but um, so for us um, as a regulator for doctors, we, we regulate how doc doctors interact with patients, but when it comes to machines and technology, that's actually beyond us. Thank you. Mm. Hey, um, respond to yeah, Kendall's uh, question a little bit. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I'm first of all very glad to hear Candy said and pointed out quite rightly that medicine is full of uncertainty and unknowns. In fact, when we use aspirin 100 years ago, we don't know what aspirin is and we don't understand why it works. Uh, but we start using it anyway. Uh, so I, I think uh, we have to admit that we do not understand everything in medicine uh, before we use it. But that does not mean that we can just, uh, just do it without any regulation. So in order for AI tools to be uh, acceptable to regulatory agency and to, to the public, I think there are at least three things that we need to consider. One is that the data from which AI uh, tools learn from has to be um, accurate and has to be uh, representing not just a certain group of population, but more a uh, universal representation. Uh, we know that uh, um, the machine can be reading a lot of things, uh, even with holes and gaps in between, and then they just um, <clears throat> try to improve care, uh, continuously. But those gaps may actually be uh, uh, leading to a wrong, wrong direction. So garbage in, garbage out, we have to make sure the data that we fit into the machine is good enough to at least have a reasonable um, algorithm being developed. And secondly, uh, I talked to engineers and they say that, yes, um, there are uh, a lot of uh, things that they even they do not understand uh, and so-called black box medicine. But that does not mean that they cannot make small steps in between that are as transparent and understandable as possible. So although the whole process is a, is a black box, but perhaps bits and pieces of it can be gradually be opened up and lightened up and become understandable. And with that, also comes the continuous improvement of the machine as we apply it to certain uh, decisions and certain patients. So it's a feedback loop 
that try to refine and to improve on the machine's performance. Uh, and I think that is very important, and which emphasize on the really important um, uh, uh, importance in producing clinical evidence, uh, and a carefully monitored and carefully designed studies which produce uh, evidence that we can base on. And right now, if you look at the literature, there is a lot of ad hoc experience, uh, ad hoc um, usage of um, AI tools. And that <clears throat> uh, in our standard, in the, in the clinical point of view, this may not actually be good enough to provide uh, solid and robust evidence that we can trust on. So I think clinicians should work hard to uh, produce more um, uh, 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 clinical trial data, well-designed uh, well studies, hopefully uh, multinational, multi-center, so that the, the result will be generalizable. Uh, uh, and then we can uh, gradually put our trust on these machines. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really good point. Uh, a black box certainly does not have to be black uh, all the time, forever. Uh, and perhaps there's an ethical imperative to at least open up some more part of the platform to the build the chance. There's a question from uh, Malaysia. Uh, thank you, King, uh, on the question. And this is a more present uh, question uh, related to how do you regulate uh, digital health and uh, telemedicine across countries? Uh, because the practice could, you know, the doctor can in one country and the patient could be in another, in another country. Um, is there any international regulations for such teleconsultations uh, where doctors may be required to register in some way uh, to practice to see patients in another country? Uh, can you, uh, I, I see that there's a, something uh, uh, touching on that in the statement of telehealth in your season. Can you say a few words on that? Sure. Um, so th um, thanks, um, Ki, for the question. So in New Zealand, we, um, uh, so our law um, for doctors, we, we say that the doctor should be registered with the medical, with, with us um, as um, the regulator. But um, the law, uh, um, so our legislation, which is the Health Practitioners Competence Assurance Act, which, which governs uh, doctors and other health professionals, um, you can't actually, while, while we say that the doctor should be registered, we can't actually compel a doctor overseas to be registered with us. So um, even though we do encourage registration, legally, we can't actually make that doctor um, register with us um, and because um, our, our jurisdiction is actually limited to New Zealand. So, so in some ways, our hands are a bit tight. Um, but what we do stress um, in our statement is that when you provide care to a patient based in New Zealand, then, when, then we regard that doctor, whether they're based in New Zealand or overseas, to be, um, we expect them to practice to the standards of a New Zealand doctor. So if anything goes wrong, we will hold them to New Zealand standards. Um, but that said, realistically, if that doctor is based overseas, um, then we, th our hands are tied in, in some respects. So it's, I guess, a bit of a catch-22. We, we hold them to standards here, but yet we can't take the sorts of actions we could if that doctor was based in New Zealand. Mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, Kendall, uh, do you encounter any problem in that area? I, I imagine you can have patients from the, in the States, for instance. Canada is very close to the States. What happens if you're providing telehealth to some patients who actually are living, or uh, even American citizens, not actually now in Canada, or, or vice versa? Or can a doctor participate in your collaborative care from the US and take care of patients in consultation in Canada? I think um, maybe um, maybe I'll add a little bit to Kenny's comments because I think there are good similarities. I also like to distinguish two types of telehealth. One is direct to patients, and two is peer to peer. For mm. direct to patients, 
Uh, we in Canada actually have 10 provinces and three territories. And each of those uh, provinces and territory has its own medical regulatory system. So even though in the same Canada, uh, we do have differences. Uh, the specifically for direct patient care, there's two kinds of approach. One is you get, uh, you get credit, accredited where the patient is. And secondly, you may get accredited where you practice mm. and then use that as a standard to move forward. I think where the patient is and you get accredited, it tends to be the more likely scenario across Canada, but not the only scenario. Mm. In BC, for example, I can practice across jurisdictions in British Columbia because I practice here. I still need, we have different geographic health authorities. I still have some mini accreditation for that. But for direct-to-patient care, those are two types. But for peer-to-peer, -peer, it switches. It switches to who's the most responsible physician or most responsible practitioner. And it's up to her or his judgment in taking telehealth. For example, if I practice in Vancouver in emergency departments, and I'm asking uh, for Professor Kevin Hong in Hong Kong and say, I, I need opinion in terms of treating this patient. Professor Hong can give me his opinion, but at the end of the day, it's me who make that decision. So again, I hold that responsibility in treatment. So that may be some general principles in approaching this uh, legal responsibility in telehealth. That's, right. That's a, a good distinction. Uh, for the uh, Hong Kong audience, uh, I'd also like to note that the Medical Council of Hong Kong uh, had, uh, has published in 2019, I believe, as of ethical guidelines on practice of telemedicine. Uh, to guide professionals in Hong Kong. It has made references to the New Zealand uh, guidelines, but there are some differences. Uh, for instance, in the Hong Kong guideline, it re recommends that uh, physicians should not engage in telemedicine unless you already had some uh, documentation relationship established beforehand. So, so you should not see a new case totally on telemedicine before a uh, documentation relationship. That's just one of the uh, points that I picked up, but it, it's a really good, good piece of work as well. Uh, so recommend the audience to look at it. There is, uh, we are running a bit short of time, but there is a, a quick uh, question uh, for, I believe for Kenny as well. Uh, uh, does the no fault compensation for medical negligence in New Zealand, does that apply to AI in clinical decision? Um. I, so that, um, I, I would say yes, but it depends. So, um, so in New Zealand, we have um, the Accident Compensation Corporation, which is a government body. Um, so in New Zealand, you can't sue um, healthcare professionals. Um, but if something goes wrong with your care, then you seek um, compensation from ACC, Accident Compensation Corporation. You need to show that... Um, you suffered injury as a result of the AI. So you, you need to show that there was a direct cause um, and how you go about doing that. That might, I, yeah, I, I'm not sure how you go about doing that, mm. but you need to establish that in order to get uh, yes. compensation. Yeah. Yes, yes, I think establishing negligence will be much more challenging with uh, AI-assisted diagnosis. There, there's a question, a second question, which I think is in part related to Professor Leung, uh, Earlier remark, but Professor Leung earlier remarked in passing. I think uh, what happens if it something becomes a sort of standard of care that that you yeah physicians are expected to to consult AI? Are they do they have obligations? Now, this is a similar question, and the question is to what extent the informed consent taken from patients should reveal uh, how much AI is being used or clinical decision making. So I think the two are, has some parallel in the sense that uh, as we use AI, we say that AI is assisting us, okay? That's nice if it's in practical level. But what does it actually mean in terms of standard care? Uh, do you have to inform the patient adequately about the role of AI in the whole diagnosis? Uh, and similarly, uh, conversely, do physicians need to observe some standard of care in consulting AI if AI is proven, proven to be really good in assisting diagnosis. So uh, any thoughts and comments from 
either the speakers or the uh, discussions? Um, well, I, I would have thought uh, under the Montgomery Doctrine, then you have to tell the patients what is of material significance to the patient. So if AI is a tool that you use and it's a very powerful tool, um, it wouldn't hurt to tell the patient that you're using it. Uh, yeah. you, how much you know about AI is another question. Yeah, that's uh, a whether clear, there's something called reasonable AI yeah. is another question. That's a clear cut point, yes. Maybe I'll jump in a little bit. I, I put a, a document uh, for those who are interested on the uh, chat, and mm. that's the FD, the US uh, Food and Drug Administration's approach to AI machine learning and regulation. I think there are some really interesting uh, approaches and concepts. It really started in 2019, looking at software as a service, look at apps, et cetera, and then look at decision support uh, tools, and then now evolving into this framework of AI and machine learning. And uh, again, with the emphasis of uh, verification as a very important part, but they also recognize uh, in some ways um, uh, uh, some, uh, you, many of you may uh, be aware that, you know, in the electronic health record development in US, uh, that the Office of Technology and FDA was very influential in uh, looking at uh, meaningful use of electronic record. And you may know that the deputy director is uh, Chuck Friedman, and he's actually had written about learning health system. I think in addition to AI and machine learning, that gives a regulatory framework. I think our health system need to start turning into a new learning health system so that not only do we look at generating randomized controlled trials, which are very important, but also rapidly learn from the different changes. For example, Elon Musk to be able to get SpaceX and landing that uh, rocket, it's very clear that usually mach machine learning and AI in the beginning, you fail often and you fail fast but they want to have those failures in safe environments so that over three, four, five, six iterations, it becomes a reliable rocket that lands all the time to the point that just this week, they actually sent astronauts who are not trained into space. And so again, I think in health, we need to also think about how do we evolve our thinking about learning health system? How do we look at evidence as it got generated and how do we leverage the use of AI and data to support us in a rapid learning cycles. I think that'll be an interesting paradigm for us to think about. Yeah, that's excellent, thank you. Uh, the um, audience can find uh, Kendall's uh, provided uh, link uh, in the chat box. And also one of the, our audience actually, actually quickly also pull up the Battle Council kind of telemedicine to share with the audience. So thank you for that. Um, let me see if there are any other questions uh, from the audience. There was a, a, a one, perhaps I'll take this as a last question. Uh, it's a question on the role of the government. Uh, because uh, so far, uh, this is a question uh, uh, from Dickie Chow. Uh, he's uh, working with the think tank uh, in the, on the topic. And instead of professional regulation, or you know, or legislation. Uh, besides legislation, uh, are there any government role in terms of AI development in the healthcare sectors? Uh, what What do we wish the government to be doing to make the whole thing working better? Uh, that is uh, perhaps related to Professor Song's uh, earlier comment on on trust and also the lack of legal readiness or legal. Uh, tools to deal with the issues. If the government takes a broader perspective or a more proactive perspective, uh, can the government, uh, by a top-down approach, uh, build some public trust or professional trust uh, in this area? If I may jump in a little bit, I'd like to introduce a, a, another kind of angle. You're absolutely right. I think for Health Canada or for health part of the government to make wise regulations to ensure safety is going to be very important. Also, I want to emphasize that, in fact, many governments look at AI and uh, ML as a economic engine. Mm. 
And so that's the tension within a government、mm. to say, do we encourage business so that our country will thrive and compete well globally, and then also look at safety? So I think I think the government has a very complex role to play.、Mm. And in fact, when you look at FDA, when you look at Health Canada, you know where, where I had a chance to、uh, privilege to to be on the advisory to the equivalent of FDA in Canada. That's where the tension is, right? How do you encourage an industry? How do you stimulate、uh, research? How do you support commercialization? Just as your Hong Kong, you know, uh, uh, I, I think Hong Kong STP, a science technology park, you know, as you encourage those type of commercializations, etc. How do you also make sure that there's safety in developing those technology? I think all governments are struggling with that kind of tension. So I think, in some ways, government do play a very important role in safety, but also I think health professionals, health organizations need to work hand in hand. With the government, with the、uh, so that we can actually emphasize the area of safety as we do test these type of technologies. That's a really good observation. The tension between introducing new technology, the economic in,、uh, incentive, and also the government's role in regulation. Professor Song, may I have a, a final thought from you on the government's role、uh, in helping developing trust or you know. Facilitating AI to be developed.、Um, well,、uh, a couple of things.、Uh, the legal side, the government side,、mm-hmm. they should set a framework because、mm-hmm. uh, they they should set where the boundary is.、Mm-hmm. Then people can know where are the lines that they should not cross. I was、mm-hmm. told by again my engineering colleagues that、um, there are far more that technology can do, but、mm-hmm. uh, what is Ethically and socially acceptable、uh, will be important. So before we have gone too far,、uh, technology has gone too far and taken away our autonomy.、Uh, we should we should ask the government to set this. And then,、um, um, other than just working on the clinical ground, I think we need to、um, do two more things. One is to work with our social scientists. To see how this kind of technology can really to put on the ground for people to be used at home on a daily basis. I mean, <clears throat> particularly for the elderly people, they may not be so uh, uh, um, so so keen to use an iPad or a, a Apple Watch and for for their healthcare. So how do we engage them into this technology driven、uh, technology assisted medicine? I think the social scientists can help us with that, particularly for those who work on community care, and then our economists and our business people can also help to prove that this is in fact cost effective, and not producing some <clears throat>、uh, technology, some gadgets which is very expensive and only the rich people can afford to use it. So that has something to do with the health、uh, equity. And also、uh, to convince the government that this will be some strategies that they would like to、uh, adopt and invest on. So the economic consideration is also very important. Thank you. And on that note,、uh, may I now uh, close the uh, seminar and、uh, thank all the speakers and the discussants for the excellent and really wide-ranging uh, uh, discussions on. Various topics. I'm sure there would be other issues, uh, and uh, that we would like to further explore in future. And we hope there will be a chance to meet each other again,、uh, hopefully in real person,、uh, at some time、uh, to talk about these issues. So thank you very much, and thank you all the audience、uh, for participating. Thank you, and have a really happy Mid Autumn Festival. <laughs>